All right, we're going to get back to our program now. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Dr. Alista East. Uh, she is the author of a forthcoming book entitled Honey, We All, We's All Creoles, Exploring South Louisiana's Creole Identity, Culture, and Heritage, which will be published uh, in the near future, uh, probably next, early next year, by the UL Press. She holds a doctorate in heritage studies from Arkansas State University and has written extensively about South Louisiana culture in all its facets. Uh, she currently serves as a board member for the National Association for Interpretation. She's director of the Cultural and Historical Interpretation section of the National Association for Interpretation. And she's a certification committee chair for the Arkansas Living History Association. And if you've been paying attention in, to anything that's been happening culturally in Lafayette in the last few months, uh, you know that she's the assistant director for the new film premiering tonight at UL's Angel Hall, First Cousins, Cajun and Creole Music in South Louisiana. Dr. East. Thank you, Michael. Well, it is a pleasure to be here. I have been um, working out of state for almost a year now, and it is so nice to be home and so nice to see so many familiar faces. There's no place like Lafayette, and wherever I go, I let everyone know that we are the happiest city in America. And so I try to bring that with me wherever I go, and they said, yep, I believe it. You're pretty happy. <laughs> so it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to come back and uh, share a little bit about what I've been doing my research on. Uh, my dissertation was on Creole culture in Louisiana, and uh, I'd like to just share a little bit of what, what I've been working on and what's going to be in the book coming out this spring. Beginning in the 15th century, Portuguese mariners uh, started forming liaisons with the African women they encountered in places like Cap Verde, which is an island about 500 miles west of Senegal. And in these areas, what you start seeing is a creolization process. As you can see in this portrait here that was painted in 1580, there's an African woman who clearly has European-style uh, hair and clothing and accoutrements. And it just shows how early the creolization process began in some parts of the world. What we know as Creoles in Louisiana is actually very similar to what you find in other creolized cultures in different places. There's Reunion Island and Haiti, lots of places where Creole culture is known. But it's almost always restricted to those with either French, Spanish, or Portuguese colonizers. You don't find that where the British went. You never find British Creole culture. What happened in the Americas is when the English came over to the eastern seaboard here and they started f becoming a melting pot or a mixed culture, a creolized population, they were known as Americans. So um, I've actually seen titles of books, you know, the, uh, the Quaker, Creoles. It's, no, that's not right. But what you do find in different parts of the world is the creolized cultures, and it really doesn't have so much to do with skin color, as a lot of people like to think. Creolization is more of the melding of different cultures that come together, and yes, skin color does play a role, especially in the, the modern day definition of Creole in this area. It doesn't always have that same uh, application in other parts of the world, but it simply meant born in the new world, or native born. So you had Creolized populations in the Americas. And as you can see the three women in the pictures, it just kind of gives you a visual of the different shades of Creole. They are all, some, you know, assuming that they're all born here in the New World, they would all have been considered Creoles. And it was a mark of honor, and it was a distinction to be considered Creole because you weren't an immigrant. Your parents were immigrants, either from Europe or from Africa, but you were from here, you were native to the area, and so you were not from coming in from the outside. And that was something that was a mark of honor for people no matter what your skin color was, no matter what your continental origins were, you were from here. And that's what made Creole such a distinction from the outsiders. During the antebellum period, this became very important in Louisiana especially. 1803, of course the Louisiana Purchase, we became part of the United States. And then in 1812, we attained statehood. And what happened was a lot of Americans, English-speaking Virginians and Georgians, started moving into Louisiana. And the term Creole became even more important and more significant because it really distinguished the French-speaking native-born population from all of the outside 
uh, English-speaking immigrants that were coming into Louisiana. If you know anything about the plantation area, you know that a lot of the Creoles were losing their land, and uh, they were, a lot of them, the plantation owners, a lot of them considered labor beneath them, so when the family ran out of money, all they had was land, so they started selling it, and all those plantations along the river started being purchased by English-speaking Virginians and other people coming into Louisiana. So it became very important to be Creole, and that friction between the Americans coming in, les Américains, and the Creoles started developing, so you kind of see that tension. So Creole became really important to, to identify yourself. As you can see in the portraits here, these were painted in uh, 1835 on the right and 1840 on the left. The same artist is painting, and they're two Creole women. And it's something that's very interesting because obviously they're not just black or just white. And that's something, again, that it wasn't so much a skin color as much as a cultural thing at the time. In the 19th and 20th centuries, that's when we start seeing a big shift toward the whites only definition. Jim Crow comes into play, uh, white Creoles who for many, many years had intermarried and intermixed with black Creoles uh, started realizing that the Americans freak out about this. It was something that was very common in Louisiana. It was very much accepted as part of the culture. And when the Americans from the outside started coming in, they could not understand our three-tiered society with enslaved Africans, free people of color, and whites. They just could not wrap their heads around that. So it became a little bit scary to talk about it, and people started denying the African ancestry that they may or may not have had. And so Creole, in the literature sense, if you talk to literary historians and so forth, a lot of them, their definition of Creole is pure white. And the, the records literally got whitewashed and sanitized. Church records got erased and scratched out because they didn't want people knowing who was in their family tree and that's when that whole white Creole really started pushing, and then you start seeing the black Creole being pushed to the side, and people didn't want to talk about it anymore because it, it was scandalous, especially during segregation. Now, the, uh, the gentleman on the right is um, French Creole. He came directly from France. His family came directly from France, settled in Louisiana. And they're French Creoles. The gentleman on the left is from Free, uh, Frilo Cove, which is a well-known Creole community around here. They're both Creole. But what happened in many cases is the gentleman on the right, their family um, just considered themselves to be Cajun because they were white and they were French speaking. And what happened is a lot of white Creole families, especially in the rural areas in Acadiana, outside of New Orleans. New Orleans still strongly maintains the white Creole heritage. But in this area, most of the white Creoles just kind of blended in with the Cajun culture. So you have a lot of white Creole families with white Creole surnames who are considered to, to be Cajun. And that is my great-great-grandfather. <laughs> so music has been in our family for a while. Uh, in other parts of the world, uh, like Reunion Island, for example, Creoles, um, Haiti, very, um, very well-known Creole country, speaks Creole. It's very interesting when you start traveling around and you meet people and you see people from different areas and, wait a minute, you, you get me. I don't have to explain myself to you. This is great. And it was really neat because these guys played a festival a couple of years ago and one of their songs was talking about Les Arico. They had never been to the United States before. They didn't know much about Louisiana. They had a song about Zotico, Snap Beans. And I told them, I said, if you guys play that on stage, the crowd will go wild because we know what Zotico is. And they're like, really? We're talking about snap beans. What are you talking about? <laughs> I said, a whole nother world. So there's three different Creole communities in Louisiana. You've got uh, Natchitoches up in the north. And then you've got um, New Orleans on the, of course, New Orleans. But the area that I want to focus on primarily is this area in Acadiana. And the reason why is because just we don't have enough time to discuss all three communities and also because if you know anything about Creole culture you know that there are very distinct communities and so for the sake of time we'll just focus on Acadiana. Uh, the flag for those of you who are not familiar with the flag uh, the French uh, colonial influence is represented by the fleur-de-lis and the Spanish influences by the castle and then you have the flags of Senegal and Mali represents the African influence. And then between the four quadrants, 
you have a cross which brings uh, which is representative of the christianity that brought the cultures together and i think this flag is beautiful because it's so inclusive you've got africa you've got uh, europe and that's really what describes creole i think the flag was developed in the 80s mm -hmm. creole inc i think is the ones who put that together or they kind of authorized it they didn't actually design it Speaking of Creole ink, as you can see in this uh, picture, there's, there are many people who are trying to keep the culture alive, and it's a little bit difficult because not all the younger generation is very interested in keeping this going. So sometimes the older people get frustrated because the kids don't want to learn French. They just want to listen to whatever radio station, the pop music, and so sometimes it's a struggle to keep it going. And then other times you realize just how remarkable it is that for 300 years we've been able to keep our culture so well preserved in spite of all of the outside influences. The Creole Inc. is one of those organizations who's trying to keep the culture and heritage going and they recognize their African and their European ancestry. One of the probably most distinguishing features about Creole culture is black cowboys. That fascinates people from around the country. They just can't get over that. When I talk about black Creole culture and Creole cowboys, they just, what? You have black cowboys? <laughs> it's like, oh yeah. Uh, it's just such a novel thing because most people around the country have not seen that. It's not part of their culture. But this goes back so far in Louisiana. In 1520, uh, Hernando um, Cortez brought in a group of Africans from the Dominicans to be able to herd cattle on his huge cattle ranch. And that has been a part of Creole culture since the very earliest days of Spanish colonization. In 1640, there was a group of American Creoles who went to Spain and did a whole demonstration on how to um, capture bulls, how to rope bulls. So this Tradition, the whole cowboy rodeo, the trail rides, all this stuff is very, very much a part of Louisiana history going way, way back. A couple of years ago, I had an opportunity to go to uh, southern France and I visited the Camargue area. It's cowboy culture there. And it's so cool because you see these connections between people who have never, ever met, but you see the origins of this stuff and you realize that some of these traditions, it's kind of like Mardi Gras. Most people who celebrate Mardi Gras don't understand how deep those roots go and how far back this stuff goes. But when you start digging a little deeper, it's fascinating. So cowboy culture has been around in this for a while. And it's still around. For generations and uh, generations. And the kids today uh, keep the tradition going. Everybody wants to dress like daddy. Uh, so you go to the trail rides, you grow up going to rodeos and doing things like that, and you realize that it's just tradition. They probably don't know how old it is because most of us don't pay attention to those kinds of details, and yet it's tradition, and that's what makes it what it is. It's such an interesting part of the heritage. For those who don't even own or ride horses, cowboy culture is still part of the scene, and when you talk about dance halls and music, when you go out to the clubs, a lot of people wear boots, cowboy hats, wear Western clothing. Even if they work in the oil industry and they come in on the weekends, they're still gonna deck out in all their Western wear to go out to the dance halls. And I think that's very interesting when you think about it because they didn't necessarily grow up on a ranch. They, did not, they do not necessarily own cattle that's not maybe part of their modern day life, but it's such a part of the culture that it's just what they wear anyway. I travel a lot. I travel a whole lot, and it's interesting because people say, oh, are you from Texas? Because I noticed you wear boots. No, I'm from Louisiana, and I wear boots. <laughs> so I have to explain that to people all the time. Oh, do you own a ranch? Nope, I dance. <laughs> all the time, everywhere? Well, when I can, yes. Uh, but it's just a big part of the culture. So whether it's at an outdoor festival, whether it's on a, a dance hall floor, you'll see lots of boots. And it doesn't really matter. Nobody's judging whether or not you own horses or not. And this might be a familiar place. Anyone recognize this location? It's where you are right now. <laughs> 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 
you are inside this very building. This is Vermilionville, right here in this, in this dance hall here. And if you notice, you see that picture, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but there's so much mixing on the dance floors today. You know, when you look, think about the old days, communities were segregated, either by choice or not by choice. And a lot of the dance halls were places where, as Pud was saying, socialization courtship occurred. So you didn't have a lot of racial mixing earlier. Today, it's very, very different in a lot of places, and you'll see that. And I think that's a beautiful thing because people just enjoy the music and regardless of where they are, and I think that's, that's just one of the things that makes this place special because you don't see that everywhere. I lived in Arkansas for several years, and I can promise you that would never happen where I was. And I think it's beautiful that we have that here. So we're gonna step back just a little bit and talk about music. Uh, one of the well-known events were the Quadroon Balls. Quadroon meaning one quarter black. Octoroon was one eighth black. Uh, the Quadroon Balls kind of came about because the disparity between free women of color and free men of color was so great. What happened was it was illegal for a woman, a free woman of color or a free person to marry someone who was enslaved or uh, someone who's the opposite, um, a different race. So for example, you had a lot of free women of color who had gotten their freedom either through manumission or because of their relationship uh, with a free man who, who liberated them. So these free women of color could not legally marry an enslaved black man because you couldn't, free couldn't marry black. And she could not marry a free white man because you couldn't have blacks or mixed race and whites marrying. So what happened was a lot of left-hand marriages, that's what they call them, it's plassage. And it's a situation where a woman of color was placed with a free man. So they were not legally married in the church, but their union was recognized by their community. And for the most part, it wasn't really looked down upon. The ratio of free women to free men of color was 70 to one. So you really didn't have much of an option. The guys had it pretty good. <laughs> Trot out 70 ladies and you could pick one. So that, that kind of shows you how, how big a part this was. So one of the places where these women could find a, a gentleman to be placed with was at a quadroon ball. And the mothers, the aunts, the grandmothers, whoever was their guardian basically, would kind of set up these relationships. And that was something that would provide the woman with financial stability. She would have a home. A lot of times her children would be freed. So this was very economically, socially, and most of the time personally advantageous because these relationships oftentimes lasted, but they were monogamous and they lasted a lifetime. Not always. Clearly there was friction whenever he married a white woman and he had his mistress in the back. That was a problem. But for the most part, this was something that was very, just, it was, it's what happened, I guess is what we could say about it. So you have the quadrant balls, very formal, very elegant dances. And then comparing with that, you had Congo Square in New Orleans, which was very different, very African. It's one of the places where Africans could get, or people of African descent could get together. And they could drum, they could play music, they could sing. A lot of times the, from the travel accounts and diaries that we have, they were, you could hear the different African languages which is kind of remarkable because in a lot of places all of that was prohibited. Um, they would describe the, the scarring on their faces and the filed teeth. A lot of these people participating in these dances came directly from Africa, so the traditions and the roots were very, very, very strong. And they would gather together by, a lot of times by linguistic uh, groups or by um, ethnic groups, and they would play music because each style was different. A lot of times people think of Africa as Africa, as if Africa is a country. There's so many countries and there's so much ethnic diversity in Africa. And from the descriptions that we have, you can see that in Congo Square, which Congo Square is named after an African country. We still have Africa, uh, Congo Square rather. I was there a couple of uh, years ago on a Sunday afternoon and there were people out there dancing. And I thought it was really neat to see that tradition being brought back because it it's been gone for a long time. And they're bringing that tradition back. And I doubt if you can see it, but way in the corner there, there is a uh, white lady who's taking pictures. And the, the 
The descriptions that we have of the Congo Square back in the 19th century is from white travelers who were intrigued with African culture. So I thought it was kind of neat how, you know, give it a century or two, and we're still people, and we're still doing the exact same things. <laughs> and yes, I was the other white lady taking that picture of the white lady. <laughs> Now we're going to bring it really close to home, and the jure tradition. Does anybody know what jure means, or where it came from? Yes, sir. Someone just shout it out. The field hollers, yes. <laughs> jure just means to swear. Jure, to testify. So it came from that, tr that tradition of testifying or swearing. So the roots of jure was actually religious in connotation. And then uh, during Lent, when instrumentation was prohibited, hand clapping and foot stomping was, was the only thing that was allowed, and that's what they did. So later on, the music genre became more secularized, but it came from that field holler, call and response tradition. And when you listen to a jury song today, there's a few people who still do it. It's not as common. Cedric Watson uh, has performed it. Uh, Jeffrey Broussard, last year at festival, did jury set with his sisters, and that just was amazing. You don't see that every day anymore, but that was awesome. So go ahead, and we'll, if the audio works, we'll try to give it a, a play. <laughs> Moi j'ai fait tout le temps du pays Avec mon genre sur plein mot Vendé à ton parent Juste pour quelqu'un Si m'a donné c'est mon trop sous Oh y'a me donné mon mes arrigo Oh y'a me donné mon mes arrigo Oh y'a I know we like to hear all the music But we can't But it definitely gives you an audio of what it sounds like, the call and response, the clapping, the foot stomping, and the energy and the enthusiasm that goes into that. It's not very complex music when you think about it in the music world. Uh, it's definitely not sheet music, but it, you feel it in your heart. And it's just, it's a really, um, and when, you're, when you see someone performing jury, because the whole body's involved, the clapping, the foot stomping, the singing, you're totally engaged in it. And it's a really interesting thing uh, to experience. Now let's move on to Lala. This is kind of with the dance hall scene that was going on the night, well before the dance halls, you had the house dances. In the 1920s through the 1940s, people were gathering together in their communities and dancing, and you had Lala music that kind of came out of the jury tradition. And then they added instruments. The accordion came in, the washboard, the washboard that you played, not the instrument so much. Uh, and that started changing the sound of things. And when you have house dances, there's a lot of background noise, there's a lot of visiting, there's just a lot of stuff going on. And so that accordion is very loud and it can kind of drown out a lot of that background noise. And so you get the La La tradition coming out of that. So we'll listen to a little clip. <laughs> Zadika that comes out of the tradition that basically Clifton Chenier brought to the world and completely transformed the music scene. Very revved up, the uh, washboard, but it's now an instrument, something you could put over your shoulders, you could move around, you could dance with it, you didn't have to sit down and play the washboard anymore. So it became a very dynamic stage performance. And some of those, um, probably a lot of you know that we just lost Buckwheat a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so I'll play a clip in his honor. 
Ça, c'est mes écarts créoles là-bas, c'est la Louisiane. Un petit peu à l'école ici. Ils y sont partis. in the Zotico tradition. You've got that older Creole tradition and you've got that Zotico sound infused in the same. And you get people like uh, Jeffrey Broussard who came out of that Creole tradition playing music with his dad and his father, branched out into Zotico, realized that a lot of the older people weren't coming out to the dance halls and weren't listening to the newer style of music. So he kind of went back to his traditional roots. He said, I want the older people to keep coming out. I want them to have a reason to come out of the house on a Saturday night and have a good time like they used to do when they were younger. So whatever direction it's going in, whether it's the new sound, whether it's the older sound, where it's coming out of the old tradition, or it's, or it's taking a new direction, I think the important thing to remember is that the music is not dead. It's very much alive and well. People are dancing. We used to not have ha um, dance halls. We used to have house dances. Now we have dance halls, and dance halls may be fading out in some areas, and they're popping up in new areas. And we have festivals, which we didn't used to have festivals. So it'll be interesting to see where the music keeps taking us, because who knows what's going to happen in the future. But definitely the dancing tradition is a huge part of the culture. And even if you don't play music, you can still dance, which is what I do, because I cannot play, and you don't want me to sing. <laughs> so, so I try to do my part by dancing. And um, when you think about the music, one of the best ways that we are preserving French is through the music. Because even the younger generation, especially in the Zotico scene, who did not grow up speaking French because it was prohibited and their parents and grandparents didn't pass it down, they sing in English for the most part. And yet they'll always throw in French phrases and words. And it's just such a part of the culture. I know that for myself, I did not realize that some words were French. I thought everybody knew what these words were until I <laughs> went out and realized, y'all don't know what citoyen means? Well, I knew when mom said citoyen, you better sit down and shut up. <laughs> and nobody else knew what that meant. Or haunt, you know, oh, don't be haunt. I thought everybody knew what haunt was. No, they thought about haunted houses. I said, no, it means you're embarrassed, don't be shy. Just things that we take for granted. So you find those little sprinklings of words here and there even in an English language song. But one of the ways that we are preserving is through the music and the language itself is one of those things where if we don't use it and don't speak it, it's gonna die. And the old generation who speak Creole, a lot of them had limited access to formal education. So they couldn't read and write French, which meant they weren't able to teach French. And so the whole French language in this area is a totally, that's another subject for another day. But I just want to kind of introduce a little bit for those of you who may not be so familiar with it. Uh, now there's, there's a lot of words and grammatical things that reflect the direct African influences. Uh, words are shortened a little bit. And it kind of came out of the communication between slave and master, really. Uh, and the African languages blending with the French languages and guess what a lot of those white babies who grew up on plantations were speaking? Creole French, because who raised them? They're Creole uh, mammies or uh, caretakers. So you have this whole blending of white communities that they really don't speak Cajun French, they actually speak Creole French. 
and whether or not they realize it, whether or not other people realize it. So the language itself is very interesting in how it developed. And now we have dictionaries to try to help us. <laughs> Um, just, just a brief overview of a couple of different phrases. How many of you are from here? How many of you are obviously not from here? Okay, wow. Well, we're glad you're here. So if you're not familiar with a lot of um, this stuff, it's, there's a lot of shortened you, you, in Creole French. I actually find it a lot easier to follow Creole than I do uh, international French personally because I didn't grow up speaking French. My grandparents spoke French as their first language. My grandfather was a translator during the war and when they got back they said you're an American you're gonna speak English and they didn't teach my parents English. Uh, they didn't teach my parents French so I had to learn it later in life. But when I'm out here like my Papa Thibodeau is speaking French I can follow his Creole it's because it's so mixed with English and Spanish words that for me it's easier to understand. So I think it's interesting that even though I don't speak Creole myself, it's one of those things where I find it's not that difficult to follow. And the repertoire, the storytelling repertoire, you might uh, recognize this gentleman on the right. <laughs> he's, he's done a little bit about stories over, the t over time. But the repertoire, the Creole, uh, is, is very interesting. They've got the African, the animal trickster tales that come out of the African tradition. Buki and Lapin, two very famous characters. They're always getting into trouble. That's more or less our Br'er Rabbit stories. And then you've got the fairy tale, magic tales coming out of the European tradition, jokes and proverbs, tall tales, and historical tales that come out of the North American tradition. And everybody, I don't care who you are, everybody who hunts and fishes has tall tales. And a lot of people here hunt and fish, so yes. Paul Bunyan has nothing on some of these guys. Uh, there's a few phrases that you find in, if, if you know French, this will make a lot more sense to you, but you might be able to kind of sound it out in your head. But again, it's, Creole is a language, and it's a beautiful language. And what I've found when talking with people who study the language professionally is that the, probably the Creole French here is a little bit closer to Haitian French than anything else. It comes out of that tradition it's because, because of the African infusion and the way certain words are spelled and pronounced. Let's move on to cooking. There's regional specialties, which gumbo, jambalaya, etouffee, all these things you hear about and you come to Louisiana and that's the only thing you get fed. So you might think that's the only thing we ever eat. <laughs> but actually a lot of that stuff that we reserve for special days and holidays, uh, we don't cook uh, seafood gumbo every day of the week, uh, but we'll do it whenever family and friends are coming over. What we normally cook and eat every day is rice and gravy. And that's definitely uh, brown rice, I mean, white rice, brown gravy, smothered kind of meats. That's our everyday fare. And then the other stuff we'll eat on occasion. The, some of the things that we eat on a daily basis that a lot of people think, oh, that's Cajun, actually came out of the African tradition, like rice and okra, and black eyed peas, sweet potatoes, greens. All of these foods come, came to us from Africa. And the way they're cooked and the way they're prepared, a lot of it comes out of the African tradition because African women were indentured, enslaved, or employed as cooks. And that's how a lot of what we know today as Cajun cooking, it's actually all creolized. The spices that you find in Cajun, Cajun food, that didn't come from, that didn't come from France and it definitely did not come from Canada because if you've been to Canada, you know they don't spice their food. <laughs> all that came out of the Creole tradition, not the Cajun tradition, although Cajuns get credited for all sorts of stuff. Then you have the vegetables um, that came in, like smothered okra, black eyed peas, things like that. Uh, rice, you've got your rice dressings, your um, smothered pork chops, gumbo. I mean, we eat rice every day in some way, shape, or form. Then you got your smothered okra, black eyed peas, and of course, your zadiko, or your uh, green beans. And if you've ever been in a Creole kitchen and you've tasted 
the fresh greens that came out of the garden, with the potatoes that got dug up, with the sausage that they made or they got from their neighbor down the road. You will never go back to, to normal eating again. And thank God a lot of us dance, because otherwise we'd be in trouble with all that good food. And then you've got places like the Creole Lunch House and a lot of lunch houses around the area where they serve home-cooked meals, but you have the convenience of, you know, we work. We don't have time to, to let something cook on the stove for four or five hours on a work day. So this kind of fills that void where you can get all those things that you're used to eating, but in a place where you can just go by, pick it up for less than 10 bucks, you can eat a whole lot better than you would at a lot of gourmet restaurants. So what does the future hold? We've got questions about where this culture is going, and what's gonna happen in the future. We hope it's preserved. We don't know how this is gonna happen and all of that. But let's kind of talk about the way, some of the ways that uh, the Creole community is trying to keep their culture alive. And I will say that for the Cajuns, the Cajun rebirth, came about you know, in the 60s, 70s, this Cajun Renaissance, and all of a sudden it's cool to be Cajun. You didn't have to hide that anymore. You could actually talk about it. You could be proud of it. And because of people like the Barry Onsleys, the Carl Brassos, uh, those pioneers, the Matea Lands, who brought Cajun understanding and culture to the forefront, that same thing is happening within the Creole community. It's just taking longer. And there's a lot of factors probably why, that's, why that has taken a little bit longer. But there are definitely efforts, and you see that, where people are going, and now it's cool to be Creole, and it's okay to be Creole. And when you talk to Creoles, they are not African American, and you better not call them black Cajuns, because that's happened all the time. It's happened in documentary films, it's happened in books, and it's such, such an, infl <laughs> you know, an insult to them, because they have their own culture, and they have their own communities, they are Creoles. And that's something very important. So they're trying to, to be a little more vocal and explain that. So one of the ways that they're doing it is through museum exhibits. And uh, ex uh, there's the Creole Museum. There's exhibits that go on. Uh, there's also special uh, events. Sorry if I'm standing in your way. I can't keep. Uh, we honor them at different festivals. The Creole Heritage Award, the Renaissance Man of the Year, Vermilionville has done a great job of trying to keep the Creole culture represented during their annual Creole Culture Day. I actually was program manager here, gosh, it's probably been about 15 years, whenever the Creole Culture Day got started. So I was really pleased to see that it, they kept it going and they've actually improved on it from the very first one that we had. And it's just a way to highlight and feature different Creoles and different aspects of Creole culture. It's always a free day, so if you happen to be in, Vermilion, in town in June, it's usually a very nice occasion. There's formal discussions where people talk about Creoles and it's being recorded and documented for the future. And there's informal discussions where people just share some of their knowledge. She's talking about the Tignon tradition, the head wrap, and explaining why that is and where that came from and what that meant, what that meant to Creole women of color. The retired school teachers who can take scraps of paper and teach children about their history and their heritage by putting together elements of the Creole flag so they understand where they came from. Uh, workshops to talk about healing traditions. And hopefully the children that are introduced or exposed to these things will pick up on those elements and they'll, they'll want to play an instrument. They'll want to make baskets. They'll want to do some of these things to keep the culture going. So looking up to the, cult, the, to the people who have gone before us and uh, hoping to, to pass that on to the next generation is definitely a part of it. And you'll see that at festival. Generations are on the stage together and you see these little guys, two and three years old, you know, like Steve Riley's son playing drums for a band that won a Grammy Award. He was three. <laughs> and that's just awesome. So when people come to Louisiana and they experience this culture, we open our arms to the world. We want to share our food. That's couscous. If you don't know what couscous is, you have not had breakfast. <laughs> uh, our dance halls, are, whether they're at festivals, whether they're in formal dance halls. Um, the joie de vivre, the people come down here, you just, you can't be miserable when you come here unless it's August and the mosquitoes are after you. 
then you've got a right to be unhappy. Otherwise, it's the best place in the world. So people from all over come to this area and enjoy uh, what we have here, and it's just an awesome thing to be able to share. So I want, if you take nothing away from this, I want everyone to come away understanding that Louisiana Creole culture, yes, it's very old, it's very rich, and it goes back three centuries, but it's not a dead culture, and it's not relegated to the quadroon women and the fancy balls in New Orleans and that sort of thing. It's very much a live culture. It's very much vibrant. It's very much present today. So no matter what direction it takes us, it may not look the same as, as maybe some have preconceived notions of what Creole culture is, but this is, this is something that I learned a long time ago. Uh, Creole, any culture, not just Creole culture, but any culture does not survive in a Petri dish. And I can't remember if that was Carl or Barry's quote, but I know one of you said it. It's because I have it in my notes. But cultures don't thrive in a Petri dish. They have to evolve. They have to change. They have to adapt. And that, I think, is where the community is going. So for, for a long time, Creoles have been caught between two worlds, um, between denying or claiming their European or African ancestry between surviving on the farm or moving to the city, between being black and being white, between speaking French and speaking English, between modernizing and holding on to tradition, between becoming subsumed by the dominant culture or maintaining their own identity. And I want to share a quote that the Creole Renaissance Festival organizers shared. They said, while many believe Creole is a race identified by a particular skin tone. True Creoles throughout this area know firsthand that Creoles of color can be as pale as a crisp white sheet hanging from your grandmother's clothesline, or as dark as a night on a bayou, and yet both can be undeniably Creole. And that's because being Creole is a lifestyle, from the French we speak to the gumbo we eat and the zodico we live to and dance by, Creoles are the heart and soul of Louisiana. And that's really what I would like to, to have everyone come away with. It's not about race, it's not about skin color. There were paper bag tests at the dance halls. You were too dark, you were too light, you were too this, too that. And it's not really about that. Being Creole is being identified with who you are. And as Michael mentioned, tonight is the film premiere, the world premiere of First Cousins, Cajun Creole um, music in Louisiana. We invite all of you to come out. It's going to be at Angel Hall on Lafayette's, uh, UL Lafayette's campus. We're partnered with Festival. We're very proud of that. And so we hope that if you'd like to know more about the music and the culture, the film kind of explains a little bit of Cajun and Creole history and culture and also talks about the music, where it's come from and where it's going. Thank you so very much. <laughs>